It's a pleasure to welcome you again to the Picture Language Seminar. Uh, as you can see on the screen, we have two more talks coming up, Marianne Leitner and Laurent Pascal Selacost, after which we'll take a one-week break and then start the 2020-2021 fall term with a talk by Jensen Wu. And in fact, if you're interested in finding out all the seminars that are upcoming, Tuesdays we're going to keep the time in Boston at 10 o'clock in the morning, you can go to our seminar page. And uh, there you see that we list the talks in the fall and they're quite a few interesting ones. The first seven are here. And two things, uh, I note the, the address of this page is mathpicture.fas.harvard.edu. And also on the page, you can find a link to our YouTube channel. And if you go to that channel, then you'll find the past talks and we have 18 since we went online at the end of March. And today it's really a wonderful pleasure to have Gilles Pizier. He's speaking to us from a beautiful location in Southern France. He's known for his wonderful work on non-commutative geometry, much uh, collaboration with Quan uh, Hua Shu. And today he's going to tell us about a non-nuclear C star algebra with weak expectation properties and the local lifting property. So Giles. Thank you. You can share your screen now. Right. Uh, let me see. Is full screen uh, good? Yes. Look good? Yeah, you will. Okay. So thank you very much. Thank you for the introduction. It's a, of course a great pleasure, great honor to speak in this seminar. I'm delighted. And uh, although I would say non-commutative analysis is more <laughs> what I do than non-commutative geometry. I, I would be an imposter in non-commutative geometry. And I'm All afraid right. this will show from my talk. This is I'm an analyst and <laughs> It will show, I'm afraid. I tried to put some diagrams, so it'll be some pictures, but... Um, no, we okay. love analysis. <laughs> <laughs> I hope. Okay, so uh, first let me uh, do some publicity for my book. You know, I had a book uh, on tensor products of C-star algebras, which is really the subject of this talk, that unfortunately came out just uh, as, you know, everybody was getting confined and uh, the, the world came to a stop. So nobody knows about this book. And uh, it, it's about the kohn kirchberg problem that I will tell you about a lot today. And in particular, the equivalence between the C-star version of the problem, which is Kirchberg's, the Kohn version of the problem, which is the, the, the Van Neumann algebra version of the problem, and the quantum information theory version of the problem, which is Cyrilson. And the book uh, goes to the equivalence of all the problems without solving uh, the problem at all. And another unfortunate thing that happened is that just as the book appeared, uh, a preprint appeared from uh, 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 an incredible team of computer scientists and quantum information theorists that claimed to have solved the problem in a, in a you know, preprint that was posted in January and uh, that's about uh, almost 200 pages and that you know is currently being of course checked but uh, that hasn't i don't think it has been checked yet from what is my information so the problem is supposed to have a negative answer according to uh, this preprint and this is what was i think expected in the sister algebra community but still it came as quite a shock especially the way the problem is supposedly solved is quite a shock so uh, the, 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 the Kirchberg version of the problem uh, is whether the C-star algebra of the free group on two generators or infinitely many generators has 
the weak expectation property or whether it satisfies this property here that uh, it, it has a unique tensor product when you tensorize it with itself. This is Kirchberg's version, equivalent to all the things I just mentioned. And uh, the, the example that I will show today uh, is the first example of a C-star algebra that has the property that there's a unique C-star tensor product on this A op tensor A. So you, you do see this, right, uh, when I'm pointing, I hope. <laughs> and... Um, you have, we only see your title page. Ah, this is bad because I'm on the summary now. Um, and uh, this happened before, so... Um, it's still not changing? No. Okay, so something's wrong. So maybe I should, uh, this is, there is, must be something wrong with my Acrobat then, but I thought that's what we did uh, in the trial. Um, so, uh, okay, so maybe I should just give a, a smaller screen or just going, go to preview and, um, do you see my screen changing or not? No, we just see the title no. page. I see your cursor moving, but just the title page. Okay, now this is strange because we we have checked this and uh, uh, okay. Uh, maybe read mode is the thing. Maybe this. Yes, that's now, yes, that works. Not change. Okay, I, I, okay, something is, must be read mode. Okay, so yes, so I showed you. Uh, Maybe you the, should pack up and show your book. <laughs> Sorry? You yes, this is the book. Yeah, this is the advertisement. <laughs> okay, so anyway, you, you did hear me, right? We hear you, yes. And okay. Now we okay. also see okay. what you're talking right. about. Okay, so, um, right, so I was saying, you know, this problem has sort of uh, three aspects. It's, it's one problem because it was shown to be equivalent. And then the, the, the question that I will present today, the example I present is an example of a C-star algebra that has both WEP and LLP. I'll explain that, what it means. This is the first example of this kind. And the point is the Kirchberg problem, the Kirchberg version of the big problem is exactly the same as asking whether the C-star algebra of the free group satisfies this property that it is weak, it has the weak expectation property. Because Kirchberg himself proved that it has the local lifting property. I'll explain all these things in a moment. And so one version of the, this con embedding problem is whether the C-star algebra uh, C of the free group, C star algebra, the full C star algebra of the free group satisfies the properties of the example I'm going to show, which is the first example that satisfies this property. Just to convince you it has some relevance, which could be argued. And the other point which uh, connects to the problem is that the algebra that uh, is constructed, which I call A, say for simplicity, actually is locally equivalent in some sense that will also be made clear with the one we want with the C-star algebra of the free group. So it has, it, it, it looks like it, it's, it's not it. And if you believe the preprint, it cannot be this algebra, but uh, it, it definitely looks a little bit like it. So let me start by, uh, okay, we have a plan uh, here, as you see, and I've already lost time, so I should uh, probably rush. Well, we started and, uh, a little uh, late, so you should uh, not worry too much about that. So I'll count, what, five minutes or something? Or, yeah. That's good. So uh, yes, I, I, it's, a, it's a pleasure for me to start this historical introduction by mentioning Grothendieck, which is you know, one of my favorite uh, heroes. And incidentally, also we have the same advisor because I was you know, advised by Laurent Schwartz for my thesis. And the key word today is a word that I think he coined really, which is uh, in the subject, which is nuclear, nuclear. 
and uh, it will be used for C star algebras, but for Banach spaces, that was uh, Grotendieck in his thesis on locally convex spaces that you know, appeared actually in Memoirs AMS 1953, very famous <laughs> thesis. And he introduced there you know, uh, the tensor products of Banach spaces uh, and showed that there's a minimal reasonable one, a maximal reasonable one, which are denoted like this after completion. And then he observed the same notion for locally convex spaces. <laughs> and he observed that uh, there were certain locally convex spaces, X, such that they have the, the, the strong property that there's a unique tensor product of the space X with any other locally convex space. And this is the origin of the term nuclear. He called nuclear such, you know, locally convex spaces. Fréchet maybe is the main example, but let's, let's just leave it like that. So uh, he also observed that uh, if you look at Banach spaces, which of course are special cases, locally convex spaces, then nuclear must be finite dimensional. There are no example infinite dimensional of nuclear Banach spaces in, in his sense. But then he asked the question, and he repeatedly asked this in the memoir in, in another famous paper of his, whether there could exist a, a pair of spaces, which I call, uh, I like this term, nuclear pair, where on the pair you would have a unique tensor product, or a pair x, y, such that you would have a unique tensor product of x and y, but uh, without the spaces being nuclear. So in some sense, this happening in, in, in a non-trivial non way, non-universal way. In particular, he asked whether there's a, an infinite dimensional space which has a, a unique tensor product with itself and which is a Banach space. So then, you know, the non-nuclearity uh, will mean infinite dimensional. So uh, one of the great joys of my early career is that I, I solved this uh, problem by a counterexample in 1981. So I produced a, a space X, infinite dimensional, which has you know, this unicity of tensor products. The tensor products sometimes are denoted pi and epsilon. That's another notation of Grotendieck, some other paper. <coughs> but that's the same thing. So it means that the projective norm and the injective norm are equivalent on the algebraic tensor product, which I always reserve the notation algebraic tensor product for just like this. And these norms are equivalent. They are not equal, but they're equivalent on the algebraic tensor product. And in, in another uh, work, I actually showed that uh, the counterexample disappears if you go to finite dimensional spaces. So if you, if you look at pairs of finite dimensional spaces and you make the assumption that there's only one tensor product uniformly over the dimensions, because of course everything is trivial in a fixed finite dimension, uniformly over the dimension, then, well, then the conjecture somehow is correct that uh, this happens only in, in the nuclear case, that is when the case where the, the dimension remains bounded. So the smallest dimensions of the two, that's the trivial case remaining bounded. That means, you know, th th this is going to be true in the, obvious, in the obvious way. And that's the only way it can be true. So in particular, the, the, the two together show that the example has very bad approximation properties by finite dimensional spaces, because uh, if you could approximate this X by finite dimensional spaces, you would get a contradiction with you know, the, the second part of the statement. And here I have something funny to say, which have made me very happy uh, for this talk today, which is that I have an excuse to tell you so much about these old results. And this excuse is a paper that just appeared in communication of math physics uh, by uh, Aubrin, Guillaume Aubrin, Lamy, Palazuelos, uh, Sharek, and uh, Winter. And the paper, as you see, is called Universal Gaps for XOR Games. We also consider quantum games from estimates on tensor norm ratios. And uh, they use precisely the phenomenon of the growth of the ratio between projective, projective and injective norm on tensor products of finite dimensional Banach spaces. They use it as an interpretation of, you know, 
uh, comparing local and global strategies in, uh, in, in certain questions related to quantum information theory. So, you know, I couldn't resist <laughs> to quote this paper that just appeared uh, and quoted today. However, of course, my, my, my you know, my, my problem is, my, my subject today is C-star algebras. And so what happened is that in the 50s and 60s, uh, similar tensor products for C-star algebras were introduced. And uh, in 73, Lance asked the natural analog of Grothendieck's question, which is whether uh, if you look now at C-star algebras, uh, and for which you have again a smallest and largest tensor product. And so the, unici the uniqueness of tensor product is reflected by this equality. So if you have this equality, does it follow that actually you have, you know, a, a C star algebra that in a moment we will call nuclear, such, which is such that you have uniqueness for any other B? And let me point out that the, 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 the motivation for the question of Lance is very natural because if you go to von Neumann algebras, the pair of a von Neumann algebra and its opposite is, has a very, very fundamental realization called the standard form, very fundamental representation called the standard form for which it is natural to ask whether you have this uh, phenomenon holding and whether this implies something, but, but that's, that's just to, to say this motivation motivates this question. So anyway, the answer again is negative, And this answer was given by Eberhard Kirchberg in a remarkable paper in 1993. And I must say that uh, uh, in the first lines of his paper, Kirchberg actually already mentions that this is analogous to my Banach space counter example. But even without that, when I saw the, the you know, when I saw his result, I immediately had this, this dream that I was <laughs> going to be able to use the methods that I had used for the Banach space case in order to, to solve this. But this was, you know, in the 90s and it took an awful amount of time until this dream actually finally became, you know, more than just crazy wishful thinking. And uh, in the end, it, it's, it actually something like that worked, but it needed much more C-star algebras that I, than I expected. So the case of C-star algebras uh, for tensor products was, you know, is something that started in Japan, I think, mainly. So in the 50s, uh, uh, Turumaru is the name that I've heard quoted, but Takezaki immediately jumped on the subject and proved fantastic results on tensor products of C-star algebras, in particular, uh, important results on the minimal tensor product of two C-star algebras. I've, I, I, I assume that you have seen this kind of thing, so I'm you know, doing such reviews a little bit fast. So when you have two C-star algebras A and B, you look at the algebraic tensor product, then the, the minimal tensor norm, the minimal C-star norm is just also called the spatial norm, is just given by the norm induced by the bounded operators on the, the tensor products of the two Hilbert spaces that appear. You do see my pointer, right, Arthur? Yes, so I can use it, okay. Yes. And so uh, that's the minimal norm, and then the maximal norm is uh, <laughs> something not difficult uh, to define, very natural also, which is uh, the maximum of all the, the pairings uh, of the two algebras with uh, representations that uh, act on uh, a common Hilbert space. So you have representations uh, pi and sigma. I think that when I do that, I, I actually hurt the lower part of the screen. Pi and sigma uh, on the same Hilbert space. Let me see if I can, can I make this bigger? No, no good. Can I make this a little bit uh, zoom? Probably. Uh, so uh, I, uh, the page changed now. The page changed, yes. So a few basic facts on um, tensorization of linear maps, which I, I'm sure you, many of you know, most of you know. So the CB norm of a linear map between operator spaces or C-star algebras is just given like this, the soup over N of the action on matrices. And then 
important properties of the minimal and maximal tensor product are that uh, the maps that, that act on the tensor products are different. So they are the completely bounded maps for the minimal tensor product, but the appropriate maps for the maximal tensor product are the so-called decomposable maps on which I will say nothing in this talk, but it's important to know that they are different and it's decomposable in the sense that it's in the linear span of completely positive maps and not every completely bounded map is in the linear span of completely positive. This is true only when the range is B of H or a, a nice injective algebra. In general, that's not true. So it's an important difference. Uh, another thing maybe to mention quickly is exactness. Exactness is another major difference between the minimal tensor product and the maximal tensor product. And uh, for the maximal tensor product, there is no problem when you pass to quotient. This tensor product is just like in the Banach space. It is in some sense a projective. It has projective properties. And the minimal tensor product has injective properties. But then, of course, it, it, that means that it's not injective. And the maximal is not injective. But the minimal is not projective. So the, 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 the fact that reflects the failure of the projectivity of the minimal tensor product is, is this identity here, which holds only for very special C-star algebras, which are called exact, and which in the separable case are simply, by a famous result, a different result of Kirchberg, are just the subalgebras of nuclear C-star algebras. Uh, nuclear C-star algebras are coming in, a, in, a, in the next in the next screen, now the screen is on. So I like to use the same uh, terminology that I've used before and call a nuclear pair, but now this will be C-star algebras. Nuclear pair of C-star algebras is such that there's only one tensor product on the uh, possible on the, the two algebras. So one completion of the algebraic tensor product, only one as a C-star algebra. And in this case, contrary to uh, the Banach space case, then we have, when we have uniqueness, this is isometric uniqueness. The norms are identical because C-star algebras, <coughs> when they have equivalent norms, these norms actually must be equal. There's a special property of C-star algebras, which of course Banach spaces don't have. Okay, and um, a C-star algebra is called nuclear if whenever you pair it with another C-star algebra, then the pair is nuclear. This is the standard definition that uh, I'm sure you've all heard. Uh, so that gives us a nuclear C-star algebra for which there is a tremendous uh, theory with lots of references that should be uh, mentioned. And I, I, I can't uh, I can't do justice to all, all the, the authors, just, just from the 60s and 70s, the main references are mentioned there, the name of Lance already mentioned, Efros and Choi Efros, uh, using Kohn's result, have proved very important results on <coughs> nuclear sister algebras. And then if you want examples, uh, commutative sister algebras, the compact operators on Hilbert space, the sister algebra of any amenable group, and um, the Kuhn's algebras are all nuclear sister algebras. But the hero of this talk is a pair. And the fundamental pair for me, which is a, a very important object, is a pair that's formed of two sister algebras. One is, and I will abbreviate the name to B, just bounded operators on L2. And the other one is the sister algebra of the free group on infinitely, countably, infinitely many generators. So first, why are these sister algebras fundamental? Well, perhaps I don't need to explain. This is, this is clear for B of L2, right? This, this algebra is injective and also it's universal for separable sister algebra. It contains any separable sister algebra as a sub sister algebra. And the other guy, its companion C, is uh, also universal, but for projectively, any separable sister algebra is a quotient of this sister algebra. And in fact, while the other one is injective, this one has some lifting property 
which makes it, you know, uh, as we will see, analogous uh, to the Banach space L1, which is the projective object in Banach space theory, while this is analogous to L infinity for if you want to compare with Banach spaces. But let, let's forget about Banach spaces. I think that's <coughs> enough. So uh, important definition, a C-star algebra is called WEP if it is nuclear when I pair it, just when I pair it with the single C-star algebra script C derived from the free group. And it is called LLP if when I pair it with the other algebra B, it is nuclear. As, as a pair, okay? So I, I'm not using the original definition, but these are equivalent definitions by, by Kirchberg's work. It gives us a very quick definition. And the, the, the reason why uh, this somehow works very well is that the fundamental pair, this is a theorem that Kirchberg discovered, the fundamental pair is nuclear. And uh, in fact, more generally, if you pair a WEP C-star algebra and an LLP C-star algebra, then the pair AB is a nuclear pair. So you have some kind of duality in some sense between these two properties, WEP and, and LLP. And as, as I said, you know, there's this analogy with L infinity and L1, which somehow is, is in the background. But if you haven't thought about these things before, it's important to uh, to remember that for WEP, there's a prototype. There's a really, a, you know, some sort of canonical example, which is B of L2, B, which we abbreviate to B. And for LLP, there's a prototype, which is C, okay? And, um, okay, this is, this is the, 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 the basic game that we are going to play now. So Kirchberg proved, as I just said, that if you have the, the pair, WEP and LLP, then you have the uniqueness, you have a nuclear pair. Now, if, if you have a single algebra which has both property, then of course this tells you that you're gonna have uniqueness of tensor product on A tensor A. And, and we, since we, we like to bring in the opposite algebra for a reason that I've already explained, it's no problem here, it's exactly the same to have uh, A, <laughs> A or AA up here, because in fact, the, the opposite will have also the WEP if A has WEP and same thing for LLP. So uh, exactly, you see that, you see now that uh, if I construct as I'm claiming to do a, a C-star algebra, which has both WEP and LLP, I will have, if it is not nuclear, I will have a, a counter example as I have announced. And this is, this, is the, this is the goal. So uh, one could wonder why Kirchberg in his paper in 1993 did not explicitly ask the question. He does not explicitly ask the question whether such a C-star algebra exists, but there's a reason for this because in, in, the, in, the, in his paper, at the time he wrote the paper, he actually thought that the WEP and LLP were equivalent properties. And he ends the paper by uh, a, a, a number of equivalent, a number of conjectures which he groups in packets. And there is the, the packet A, conjecture A, which is then declined in A1, A2, A3, A4, I think it goes to A8, equivalent that he shows are equivalent conjectures. And the conjecture A is just the conjecture that the, algebra, the pair BB, or equivalently BB up, is a nuclear pair. The conjecture, the other group of conjecture can, is equivalent to the fact that the, the pair CC or COPC is a nuclear pair. And now he showed that the conjecture A is equivalent to the implication WEP implies LLP, which he conjectures thus, and conjecture B is equivalent to LLP implies WEP. So that was, what he had in mind at the time, and that's why he didn't go into conjecturing the example that I'm presenting. But conjecture A was disproved by Junger and myself a couple of years later, and uh, conjecture B unfortunately remains open or perhaps has just been solved by the five authors uh, that I've mentioned in the beginning because 
Kirchberg showed among the five or six equivalent forms of conjecture B, one of them is the code embedding problem. So he showed that this conjecture is equivalent to the code embedding problem. Or if you like, the implication LLP implies WEP is equivalent to the code embedding problem. Or if you, another way to, to put it, the cone embedding problem is equivalent to the fact that this sister algebra C is both WEP and LLP. So if you, now if you get to this point, as I did, you know, you, you ask yourself, but is there any sister algebra that can have these properties? And then, well, you know, except for the nuclear case, there was, there was no example. So I think I went in the wrong direction, sorry. Okay, so uh, here I can't resist mentioning this because this uh, might, this is, I think, is, is an important information to have if you, if you go into the subject. Kirchberg observed that uh, when you go to this uh, property that uh, there's a unique sister norm on A op tensor A, this assumption alone implies the WEP. So it implies that AC is nuclear. It uh, takes a moment to see it. It's part of his, his work. It, uh, it's not, not so, so hard to see, but now this, this thing is, is completely clarified because the converse, which is a natural question, is not true. That follows from what we proved with uh, Junger because for B of H, which is WEP, you don't have this uh, uniqueness. So the converse is not true, but still what is true is the following beautiful theorem of Hagerup, which is unpublished, but the, the full proof is in my book. It's unpublished by Hagerup at the time. It's from the, the 90s. And it says that this WEP is characterized by this identity here on A op tensor A, but only if you restrict it to what I like to call the positive definite tensors, that is the, 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 the cone formed by the sums of the following form on A op tensor A. So that's a you know, positive cone in, in, in some sense. Now, if they coincide on the positive cone, that characterizes WEP but it doesn't imply that they coincide everywhere, which was you know, the difficulty for what we did with Junger. We had to, to uh, avoid this fact where actually they did coincide. Okay, mm -hmm. the, the original definition of Lance is not at all what I took. It, it's, uh, it has a beautiful, uh, uh, he, he, he gave some beautiful characterization in terms of various extension properties. Let me just stick to one that explains the word weak expectation quickly. So Lance's characterization of the weak expectation property is, is uh, you can read it in this, in this diagram. A has the weak expectation property. If and only if there is a, a linear map T from B of H, B of H containing the C star algebra A, from B of H to the bidual of A, not to A, to the bidual of A, which coincides with the identity on A. And phrased more rigorously, it means that the restriction of this map T coincides with the canonical inclusion of A into its bidual. Okay. And you see, the, if T was with values in A, that map would be a projection and therefore would be a conditional expectation, et cetera, with all the properties that we know by work of you know, Tomiyama and Takizaki and, and others. But its, it's values in a double star, so it's not a projection and that's why he called it weak expectation. And then the weak expectation property is, is when this happens. One can generalize to general phenomenal algebra, phenomenal algebra is generated by A instead of you know, the bidual, which is the universal one, but it's the same, same thing. So the weak expectation property has this slightly uh, strange feature that uh, it mixes, uh, it's a bit hybrid or hybrid, not sure. If it, it mixes you know, nuclear sister algebras, which are usually separable, with injective phenomenal algebras, typically B of H, which, which are non-separable. 
but this is uh, this is how it is. It's 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 an intermediate property, uh, a little bit between you know the two realms, mm -hmm. C star and W star, perhaps. Now I pass to uh, the local lifting property. So the local lifting property uh, is uh, what is also expressed by uh, a diagram. So lifting property, uh, you can imagine what it is. Uh, you, you consider a, a quotient C star algebra, C quotiented by an ideal and the quotient map Q. And of course the, the lifting means that uh, we, if we want to the lifting property of a C star algebra A is that when we have a map from A to this quotient, we want to lift. And uh, here, uh, the property that I'm defining is local in the sense that you cannot lift in general, but you can lift if you restrict to finite dimensional subspaces. Okay, and here the lifting, I, I could go completely positive, but I prefer to state just completely bounded. So the lifting is just controlled by the completely bounded norm. So once again, the local lifting property means for the sister algebra A, whenever we have, we could say, a star homomorphism into a quotient, and we restrict to an arbitrary finite dimensional subspace, then there is a lifting, which is a complete contraction. And the property is equivalent to just saying that there is a lifting which is, you know, has a completely bounded norm arbitrarily close to one, because mm -hmm. <laughs> this, there are general results that say that you can actually pass to the limit here, but I prefer to mention it like that. Now, uh, I don't need the lifting property, but I definitely want to mention it for a, a, a good reason. So uh, I'm not going to, to use it, but one of the uh, comments that Kirchberg made at the end of his papers with all the comparison of the conjectures and so on, is that he writes that if his conjecture is true, or equivalently, if the coin embedding problem has a positive answer, then actually the local lifting property implies the global lifting property for separable C star algebras. Global lifting property is, you know, the same as before, but just you don't have to restrict to the subspace and you look at completely positive liftings. I don't want to define it precisely. <laughs> but the important thing is that on my example, for instance, I, I cannot show that the example has the lifting property by any uh, trivial reason. And in fact, I, I, I would be ready to, to, if I was daring, I would conjecture that I think my example does not have the lifting property. And therefore, if one can show this, that it does not have the lifting property, it will also show that the Kirchberg conjecture is wrong. But it's an approach, it's, it's another dream, one more dream perhaps. Okay, um, the local lifting property has important uh, uh, use in connection with the problem whether X is a group. And uh, for instance, uh, uh, Kirchberg showed that uh, uh, C star algebra has the local lifting property uh, if and only if the cone algebra associated to the C star algebra has a property that X is a group. And, and it's related to what is in this screen here, that if you have the local lifting property for a C star algebra C, and if D is any other C star algebra, and now you have a sequence of maps which are only asymptotic star morphisms, which uh, is, you know, the obvious thing that you guess that it means. It's a sequence of maps, so it's an asymptotic star morphisms. It's, it satisfies the, the obvious properties, but just in the limit. Then uh, the map, the sequence of maps actually is locally uniformly, well, say locally asymptotically completely bounded, as, asymptotically completely contractive, I should say. And this is reflected by the conclusion here, that is if you restrict again to any finite dimensional subspace, <coughs> the, 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 the norms, the completely bounded norm will be asymptotic to one. And this is actually an easy consequence of the definition of the local lifting property, uh, well, of the previous property, the, the formulation 
with um, local liftings. But let me let me go on. So I will need for some notation for uh, what comes next. So uh, it's good to introduce it here. So bounded sequences of elements of D is L infinity of D. I use here the Banach space notation. C star algebra I use products. I'm not too fond of that. C naught C not of D is the sequences sub the subset, the subspace formed of sequences tending to zero. This is where C star algebra is used sigma. <clears throat> and uh, I need also a short for uh, one plus epsilon completely isomorphic. Okay, and so let me let me abbreviate it by this last line here. Two operator spaces will be called one plus epsilon completely isomorphic. If there's an isomorphism that's completely bounded, inverse completely bounded, and the product of the norm is, is controlled um, like this. So that uh, allows me to, to uh, state uh, in, in short uh, the definition that uh, a C-star algebra, for a C-star algebra A to locally embed in another one, so A locally embeds in C, if that's a definition also inspired by Banach space theory, if for any epsilon and for any finite dimensional subspace of A, there is in the sister algebra C, a copy of the first one. So for any Z, you can find Z prime in the other sister algebra, which is a one plus epsilon copy of the first one in the completely bounded sense, in the complete isomorphism sense. And then let us say for short that we have two sister algebras that are locally equivalent if each one embeds locally in the other, okay? So the point that I want to make here, which has uh, some relevance to the construction is that if the sister algebra A has LLP, then automatically it locally embeds in C. And this is, this is actually very easy to, to, to explain because this follows from this diagram. I just wish that this uh, <laughs> black bar would not appear every time. So you see the, the, the diagram explains this. Suppose that you have A with LLP. So the C-star algebra C is universal for quotients. So we know that A is a quotient of C. Okay, so I can identify A with the quotient C over I. Now take an arbitrary finite dimensional subspace of A. Well, you have this local lifting. So you have a map V that goes up to C that is going to be actually completely contractive. And so this, this E is actually going to embed completely isometrically even in C. Okay, so LLP implies locally embedded in C for completely very, very direct, direct reasoning. So uh, with Junger, actually uh, the, the way that we showed uh, that the weak expectation property does not imply the local lifting property is very much related to what I just said because what we showed actually is that there are C-star algebras with WEP that do not locally embed in C. And what I just told you is that LLP implies locally embedded, locally embedding in C, local embedding in C. Okay. Uh, however, it, it turns out that precisely, precisely if you uh, introduce, if you somehow remove this obstruction by assuming that you work with an algebra that does embed in C, then the implication is true. And, and we use this in the construction of the example. So that's, that's a, an easy fact from the coming from, you know, the, our work with, with Junger, it's in the background of, of our paper. So if you have a sister algebra that locally embeds in C. So if you assume it locally embeds in C, then the implication is okay. The implication that's false in general becomes true. WEP implies LLP. So that's important for me because that makes my life easier. In the example that I'm going to construct, you see, I only need to worry about the WEP 
as long as I make sure that my example locally embeds in C, and it's, it's easier to just have an embedding rather than, you know, to local even, rather than to worry about uh, more. So now we are going to worry about AWEP locally embedding, embeddable in C, and that will give us the example. And that's a statement of uh, the main result. And uh, as I said, the, 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 the algebra A will, will be in fact more, it will be locally equivalent to, to C. Perhaps this is a good point uh, to ask whether there are questions. I, I'm very worried that I might have just saturated you with notions uh, that are not necessarily of interest to, to all in the audience. Uh, are there any questions? Okay. Okay. So uh, I was intending to bore you even more by <laughs> sketching the construction by uh, giving a, a, a description of the, how this uh, object is uh, constructed. And uh, it's constructed using uh, a, a special criterion, but in fact, you know, after I, I, I one construction worked, I actually uh, uh, made it work in several different ways. So I have, I can do the construction basically in, in several variants, depending on what is your favorite uh, characterization of the WEP. You give me the characterization, I'll, I'll, I'll explain how to do the example with this characterization. However, the first uh, construction was with the, what I think is the easiest criterion, and perhaps that's that's it is gives the the easiest proof. But I can also do it just with directly, you know, the min and max tensor products. It, it's technically more complicated, but the same principle work. And the 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 idea is that, like in the Banach space case, we are going to stack finite dimensional spaces one on top of the other, in such a way that we we obtain the infinite dimensional object as a as an inductive limit that's you know just uh, obtained by of course worrying at each stage uh, from the by induction from n to n plus one uh, worrying about what happens with respect to well these weak expectation property and local lifting that that we want to build in Okay, so the characterization we use is, is fairly simple. It's, uh, it's with this, uh, it's all in this diagram. So we look at a, a linear map at the bottom here, you see a linear map from a subspace of L1N, where L1N now you have to think not at the N dimensional L1 space, well, it is the n-dimensional L1 space, but we want to think of it as an operator space. So now you must think of it as sitting inside the full C-star algebra of the free group, which is our canonical object C, but just spanned by the free unitary generators, the canonical free unitary generators. And you just take n of them, and it's simpler to, to take n minus one of them and the unit, it's the same. If you want to take n of them, the same object works. And now the, the extension property that we are considering for A is that any completely bounded map from S to A extends to a completely bounded map from L1N to A with essentially the same CB norm. So you have this, uh, this uh, inequality appearing here. Uh, incidentally on L1N, but that plays actually very little role. The CB norm is the same as the norm. So for this U tilde here, I could put the norm of U tilde. It might, it might actually be of some use. So I mention it, but in the construction, it doesn't really matter. So as I said, we are going to build an inductive limit. So we have this uh, sequence of finite dimensional subspaces ANs that are going to sit in some ambient C star algebra script L, which allows us to compute limits. And A is just going to be, you know, the, the closure of the union of the ANs. We're gonna have a sequence tending to zero of epsilon Ns, 
controlling our approximations at each stage. Actually, these will have to be summable. And of course, the idea uh, is, is this. That's the first basic idea of the construction is we want to force this algebra A to have the extension property. And it will have because the, the, the sequence of subspaces, the tower of subspaces, AN, AN plus one and so on, they have the extension property in the sense that the next one has the extension property with respect to the preceding one. So if I take my map U into AN, I can extend, but with values in AN plus one. Okay, and now I'm sure you're convinced that this is, this is good, right? I mean, if I have this, then I'm going to be able to have for the completion of the unions, I'm gonna have, you know, by, by some easy perturbation arguments, I'm gonna have the, the, the bona fide extension property that I want because a map into A will be approximately a map into some AN, and then I can adjust the dimension of this L1N easily by, by just making it bigger. And then it will always look like what is in this diagram here in the, in the center. So I'll get, I'll get what I want. Then of course, an important thing will be to, to maintain that the ANs actually have some relation to C because if I can, if I can make sure that the ANs are epsilon completely isomorphic to subspaces of C, then I will know that the algebra A locally embeds in C. And if it locally embeds in C and I have the WEP, then I'm good. I have the full LLP. So that's, that's the plan. So why, wh what is the problem? Why is there a problem? What are the obstacles? So, so let, me, let me say this because I think it's a, it's a pretty good, uh, gives a pretty good feeling of, of what goes on. So we want to do an extension property. So an extension property, you know, it's, it, it's obvious how to realize it because we're in, a, we're, you know, we have this object B of H that contains everybody and that is injective just fully injective. So if we start from AN, we can just here replace the question mark by B of H and we are done. We have solved our, our, you know, our diagram of, of extension. But precisely the B of H, uh, the B of H solution is no good because this is too big. B of H does not locally embed in C. So if we do this, starting from a good AN, we pass to something bad, which has the extension property. So we need, we need something different, okay? So that's, that's one problem. This problem actually uh, can be solved in various ways. And it, it, I, I, a few years ago, I, I, I thought I was on the right track, but I was a bit uh, misled. It turned out to be a dead end. I, I could somehow produce uh, what I wanted, but only in the operator space context. So one can actually, make what I described here work in a different way, inspired by you know, the, the Banach space construction, but you produce an operator space that satisfies the extension here that is desired and not a C-star algebra. So the, the second difficulty, which is really for me was the main difficulty was to, to, to understand how to obtain a C-star algebra, how to obtain linking maps, which were close to multiplicative, close to morphisms in order to get a sister algebra in the end. Okay, and so for this, we needed a, a, a notion. So, you know, that's of course the, the standard type of notion of a almost morphism. So an epsilon morphism is just, a, you have the axioms here, a, a mapping from a, a linear subspace, which is going to be usually a finite linear subspace. Then the map will be almost contractive and then almost multiplicative. And I could put almost self-adjoint, but uh, for the construction, let's, let's do everything self-adjoint and the subspace self-adjoint that, that works. So that's an epsilon morphism. And uh, the ingredient, which for me uh, was, uh, was the key, was to replace the, the algebra by the Kohn algebra. And this is also already important in, as I've mentioned already in Kirchberg's paper, passage to the Kohn algebra and the properties that it has. And here what happens is that uh, the Kohn algebra, when you are in the presence of a lifting problem, if you pass to 
uh, the, the associated cone algebras, which are defined here. This is the tensor product, cone algebra of A is the tensor product of A with, with this algebra C0, which is defined in this line. So you pass to, the, the, from a, a quotient map C to B, you pass to the, the associated quotient map tensorizing with C0. Uh, so you have a quotient map now on the cone algebras. Then the new quotient map almost lifts. And this is not true for the original quotient map. A, a general quotient map on C star algebras will not satisfy what is written here at the conclusion of this lemma but it works for the, the cone algebras. So what it does is that you have, uh, 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 you have local bounded liftings. This actually was well known for you know, forever, perhaps I should say, but you, in the cone algebra context, you have local bounded liftings, which are also epsilon morphisms for any epsilon that you give yourself in advance. And uh, then the, the whole solution is works because we can take these epsilon morphisms and make products of them and compute that if we make products of them with uh, epsilons that are summable, we get other, other epsilon morphisms and so on. So the, the use of such Cohn algebra and approximate morphisms appears in the, the work of Cohn and Hickson on E-theory um, but uh, I, I don't really see the connection, uh, any connection so far to, to the construction and the way I use them. So now the, the basic setup is, uh, is like this. We have uh, our sister algebra B, okay, and our sister algebra C. And B is universal for embeddings. So we do know that uh, the sister algebra C is a subalgebra of B. So if I, it might have been smarter for me to cheat and tell you that I just work with B, but the fact that it is non-separable, the B algebra being non-separable creates problems. And so it's, it's just better to replace it by a smaller separable sister algebra, which I denote straight B and which is still intermediate. So it, it is still intermediate between C and B and in, more importantly, it still satisfies the WEP. I remind you that B is the model of WEP. C is the model of LLP. So we, we just replace the non-separable guy by a separable smaller guy with the same property. And now we have the diagrams that are uh, here below. You see that this is, this is the fundamental picture that makes the construction work. We have uh, an algebra C that embeds in B, but this B is also a quotient of C, okay? <clears throat> and so perhaps I could, to, to, to give the idea of proof, perhaps I should say things like that. Assume for a moment, so let me give, this is the, the fashionable word, let, let me give a fake proof. Let me give a fake proof, okay? So fake proof would be, you know, I pass to the, the Kohn algebras and the fake proof would be, oh, if I pass the Kohn algebra, fantastic, I can lift, okay? So I can lift. So if I, if I can lift by a star homomorphism, which is obviously a big lie, but if I can lift with a star homomorphism psi, then I look at this composition and I have a map from this algebra to this image that factors to this guy, which is WEP. And so there's no problem. The, the map, the, the, the algebra, the underlying C star algebra will be WEP. And since it is the C not C, it is LLP. So that's, you know, we have immediately our, our example there, but this is of course, a wild cheating, cheating wildly, except that this works if we pass to finite dimensional subspaces and we start doing a, an inductive limit based on the same idea. So, so that's uh, how I can describe the, the key step here. We will have now a finite dimensional, this is closer to the truth, finite dimensional operator subspaces EN inside this Kohn algebra of C. We have embeddings TNs from EN to EN plus one, which are going to be completely one plus epsilon isometric. 
epsilon n morphism, epsilon n will have to be summable. And also we need, of course, to be able to form many products. So we assume that uh, this condition here, which is very natural. And then the key step is that for each En, finite dimensional subspace in here, and for each U into En, well, we can produce En plus one, we can produce Tn and U tilde such that all <coughs> the conditions that you expect, you know, are, are satisfied. So that's, that's really the, the key picture. Then how do you find the inductive limit? So now we have a sequence of spaces En, a sequence of linking maps. So this is a very formal, you know, screen. You, we just look at the quotient to form limits. We look at the sister algebra, which is the quotient of bounded sequences by sequences tending to zero, so abbreviated to L. We have a quotient map from bounded sequences to, to L. I mean, you know, people you use, I could use perhaps ultra filters also, but this is sort of more natural in the separable here context. And then, uh, uh, the, a, the, the subspace AN is just uh, the image under the quotient under the limit map. Q, Q is just the limit map. So the image of the limit map of the sequence X, TN, X, TN plus one, TN, X, TN plus two, TN plus one, TN, X. So, so we, just, uh, we just compose successively these maps TN in order to produce something which is like the inclusion. Okay, so let me, uh, I think if I have four minutes, I can go to really the, 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 key, the key idea that makes everything that I've said click. And it is diagrams. It is approved by picture. So it fits, uh, I think, this seminar. So we, we are starting with uh, this EN and this diagram like this. And I remind you, we need to produce EN plus one and TN. So this is where we are going to, to do better than the fake proof, but it's the same idea. So En is in C naught C, and then this C naught C embeds in this algebra C naught B, which as you assume correctly is WEP. It inherits the, the, the property of, of B. So now we're in this WEP algebra C naught B by this embedding, okay, and this algebra C not B being WEP, it satisfies, of course, the extension property because this characterizes WEP. So we have this long arrow here that is the extension of the map that uh, is on the, on the lower line. Now, L1N being finite dimensional, this map the, the, here, this extension map actually takes, it has its range in a finite dimensional subspace of C not B which I call uh, EN, uh, script EN inside this space. And here, this is where I use the lifting. So now I have a finite dimensional subspace. I can use the property of the cone algebra that I have an almost multiplicative lifting. I have an epsilon morphism that lifts this map or epsilon chosen arbitrarily small. So I don't give all details. This is psi, the, this epsilon morphism that lifts. And then you simply, you simply now use for En plus one, the range of this map Psi. So this is what is written in the last line for En plus one and Tn, just the restriction of, of Psi. And you see that we've made the diagram commutes. The only thing that needs to be checked is of course the detail that Tn should have a, a, a completely bounded norm close to one an inverse with completely bounded norm close to one. This will guarantee that the ANs are close to EN and therefore that the algebra A locally embeds in C. And, and the rest, well, you can imagine easily that because the maps were close to multiplicative, this produces a C star algebra. And, and the diagram, the key diagram here produces the weak expectation property. So, so that's, uh, that's how we, we get it. So I think I should skip this. Uh, I think maybe I'll just end up with this screen. So uh, lastly, why can we get an algebra that is equivalent, locally equivalent to this, the algebra C? 
C or C naught C, by the way, are locally equivalent to each other. So this is the, the same thing. Well, the reason is very simple, is that we are using this uh, inductive uh, construction of En plus one inside C naught C, starting from En, uh, starting from En in, uh, in C naught C, this is, this is the diagram. And you see, if we enlarge En plus one, suppose that we take En plus one and we stick in there, we stick in there some finite dimensional subspace completely arbitrarily, well, this diagram still holds. It just makes things complicated, more complicated for the next step. But this is an inductive construction, so it doesn't matter. So, so we can insert here anything finite dimensional we like. And then that explains this, uh, this last screen. And finally, I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Well, we thank you, Gilles, for actually painting a very beautiful picture of a very complicated subject. And uh, I'm sure that there'll be much discussion. So are there any questions? I'm very happy to see Masamichi on my screen. I am very flattered, Masamichi, to see you. <laughs> Masamichi, do you have some comment? Are there other questions? Well, I have a, a, a quick question. Sure. Uh, I, Hi, you know, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know how realistic it is, but uh, is it, would it might it be possible to approach the Klein embedding problem <laughs> in this from this point of view um, with, with using the um, considerations uh, of, uh, involved in Kirchberg's uh, conjectures? Great question. Well, there are uh, the, the answer definitely is yes, of course, <laughs> but it hasn't worked. And, you know, it's been the, the idea has been around for a long time. So uh, there are several things that I, I, I could say to, to answer your question. But one very amusing thing is the, again a connection to Grothendieck's inequality. You know that some people, me with others, we have developed Grothendieck's inequality versions of it for operator spaces. And um, there's uh, one, uh, so, so actually it's the original Banach space Grothendieck inequality that comes up. And so what you have is uh, that one, one form of the Kirchberg conjecture or the Kuhn embedding problem boils down to asking whether when you look at, okay, what I called L1n, I, I, I don't have the technique to, to write here, but what I call L1n, you can look at L1n tensor L1n. So the span of the generators, tensor the span of the generators in the C star algebra C of the free group, okay? And now if you show that the min and max norms coincide on, on this object, you have the conjecture. The conjecture is equivalent to that, that these, the, the, the min and max norm coincide on L1n, tensor L1n, for any n, you need any n, okay? But the Grothendieck inequality tells you that the norms are equivalent there with a constant which is the Grothendieck constant up to the Grothendieck constant. So you have a, an inequality which you know is true with constant uh, four over pi, I think it is. <laughs> and if it was true with the constant one, it would be the coin embedding problem. So, you know, in the way you phrased your question, definitely, yes, it can be approached. It can be approached, but it has been <laughs> approached. And mm. so far with, uh, with no success. I think what I mentioned in my talk Oh, is, is, is very iffy because it doesn't go as a if and only if thing. But uh, I have a feeling that, uh, you know, the fact that uh, we cannot prove that local lifting implies global lifting, that now that we have, you know, a handle on producing examples as the one I have, 
I think uh, it might be a, a way to, 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 well, to find, you know, a negative answer, an alternate, probably alternate uh, negative answer to the, to the problem. But I think people who work in phenomenal algebra think that, you know, that's anyway, the, 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 the solution should be, the, the, <laughs> the right solution should be to produce, you know, the phenomenal algebra, which has the characteristic that it does not embed in a ultra product of matrix algebras. And it's indeed, it's, it seems okay, thank you. It, it will be. So are there other questions? Sergio, you're unmuted. Did you have a question? No question. I don't know whether you can hear me. I want to just to thank you for organizing all these beautiful events and to thank Gilles for the wonderful talk. <laughs> uh, I, I, one more thing about, you know, George's question and uh, reminds me an important thing which I didn't say, uh, which is that um, Obviously, even you know, assuming that everything is correct, the the in the the preprint of the five authors, so the solution is negative. There's a lot of work to do because uh, you know, of course, <laughs> clearly there will be other solutions. It's it's hard to imagine that you know this is this is the only way. I, I was afraid that someone might come up and show the problem is undecidable. And then if someone comes up and shows the problem is undecidable, I give up. I'm not going to think about the problem anymore. This is, I'm afraid this is how I am. <laughs> but, uh, but what they showed is that there is, you know, supposedly a negative solution. And, and I, I, believe the, I believe this is probably the case. Is they are correct, and uh, there will be other uh, other ways to show it. But the the another another crucial question is to produce groups, okay, which uh, which do do which which fail the the cone embedding problem, such that the phenomenal algebra discrete groups, such that the phenomenal algebra generated fails the cone embedding problem. This is the infuriating thing that, you know, this has not been done and uh, their paper doesn't do this, right? The paper does, uh, does the Tsirilson uh, form. And um, this is, of course, is related to the question uh, whether every group is suffix and uh, things like that. The very rich area, which uh, is, uh, is why, do well, is, difficult but um, seems still wide open. So I see many other experts in the audience. Does anybody have a comment? Mikhail, do you? No, I um, don't have any additional comments. It was a really a lovely talk. Thanks, Bill. And, uh, and I certainly agree uh, with your comment that uh, finding, for example, a group, not even a concrete group, but a way of constructing a group that fails to be uh, contemplatable uh, would certainly be something uh, much desired for. And it's also, I think, um, uh, I mean, it says something about uh, uh, the, announced, the announced proof uh, that you cannot even say that such a group exists. I mean, it's somehow it is so indirect that you cannot even answer that question. And, and of course, from a point of view of both uh, operators bias and group theory, that is not uh, satisfactory. And we hope, um, we hope maybe for a better, a better, a better solution in the future. Um, I'd be wonderful, maybe even more wonderful, if one could uh, uh, give an argument using uh, using your. Uh, uh, this proof you are mentioning here. By, by the way, another thing that I could have mentioned is that, of course, uh, the construction that I described, as you guess, is, is really C star algebraic and it does not produce, also does not produce a group. But the, the candidate was the candidate was all the time the full C star algebra of the free group. So the natural question is, can, can one do an example like mine 
for the full C star algebra of some group. So is there a group non-amenable such that the full C star algebra, you know, is WEP and LLP? And it's not, it's not easy because very little is known on, on uh, these properties in the context of group C star algebras. So there's been recently uh, very nice work by uh, Johanna and uh, two co-authors uh, uh, producing, you know, uh, groups failing the local lifting property. Very, very nice work. The SL3Z and all the, 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 all the series of the natural groups with property T fail the local lifting property for the full C star algebra. It's a very interesting <coughs> paper that's uh, recent, a few months ago. But more like that, more, more, more information is needed of this kind in order to, to, to construct an example of group uh, with the same properties like my example, I think. So are there any other comments? I think one, one thing I asked, I think I asked yeah, Paul by some point, but he sort of dismissed my question was if there would be any construction of um, <clears throat> embedding an arbitrary true one factor into say the ultra power of a group phenomenon as well. But apparently such, this has not been, uh, I mean, such a construction ha has not been made or even attempted and maybe it I seems see. to be far too far fixed. Mm -hmm. to re you mean to reduce the, the, system, the phenomenon question to the group question? Right? Yes, yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah. Well, Popa must have tried that. No, you, did you ask Sorin? Yes, precisely. And he kind of did dismiss the question as, you know, uh, <laughs> I mean, maybe this could not be done. Or, you know, <laughs> I mean, obviously he thought about it. Obviously he thought about it. Yes. Well, if there's no further discussion, thank you again, Jill, for a very thank wonderful you. talk. Thank you. And it's interesting to see how our audience changes from week to week, but maybe unmute yourself and <laughs> applause. <laughs> yeah. um, okay. We'll look forward to seeing you again next week. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Thank you to everybody for listening.